Hello, Bigger Pockets Nation. This is contributing blogger Doug Dow. Joining me on today's Q&A session entitled Private Money 101, you will get answers to the burning questions like, how do I pool private money without creating a security? How do I market legally for private money? And what to do to get started? In addition to other great tips, tricks, and traps, today's expert is Gene Trowbridge. Gene is an instructor for CCIM. CCIM is the education program for commercial investors and brokers alike. In addition to that, Gene was a commercial broker, successful syndicator, and now wears a lawyer hat. Gene, welcome to the call. Well, thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here. As you said, I I was uh, I started out as a commercial broker, and then somewhere along the line, I went into being a full time syndicator. That was a long uh, a long stretch, and. Uh, Oh, about 20 years ago, I went to law school. I'm an old guy, but so it was kind of a, a midlife thing. I went to law school, and for the last uh, 10 years, all I've been doing uh, in the real estate world is helping people form um, limited partnerships and LLCs and syndicate uh, real estate and other things by drafting all the uh, legal documents they need to uh, complete their offering. Outstanding. And and uh, just for the record, everyone, we are going to be doing a two-part series. Uh, today's call will be covering Private Money 101, uh, the basics uh, that you may have questions about private money, and then also in next week's uh, call of this portion, we're going to talk about a little bit more advanced stuff for so folks that have uh, probably already investing and want to scale their business up. So, Gene, why don't we get started? Uh, it seems like it's actually easy to violate securities law without intending to. Uh, could you just tell us what is a security? All right, Doug. The definition of security comes from a long time ago. It comes from the, the Securities and Exchange Act, really, of 1933. And it's a real long definition, and it starts with the words a note, a stock, a bond, and so there are all sorts of things that are in this definition. But the one that we fall under most of the time in doing a real estate syndication would be the definition of something called an investment contract. Now, an investment contract, that was a nebulous term, and it wasn't until about 10 or 12 years after the law was passed that uh, the Supreme Court really decided what the definition is. And to make a long story short, the definition of an investment contract really has four parts. It's an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit through the results of a promoter or a sponsor. So, uh, Doug, if you and I, if I just called you and said, let's do a deal uh, out here in California, Doug, you send me mm -hmm. the money, I'll take care right. of everything. I'll, we'll buy a property, I'll form the LLC, I'll manage it, and I'll send you uh, your profit. Uh, that would be an investment of money on your part. The common enterprise would be the LLC that we formed and the fact that we're trying to do this deal together. The third thing is, I imagine somewhere along the line I told you that it would be profitable. This wasn't a gift. And the fourth thing and the most important thing we always have to deal with is, is Gene doing all the work or are Gene and Doug collectively doing the work of a unanim unanimous voting right? But what I offered you was, I'm going to do all the work. That's a security. Right. Um, so going back to that, if, if we're in an LLC structure, then um, if if we're jointly voting – and some some structure of joint joint membership, uh, it seems then that is not a security then if we all have management rights. Is that correct? If we're going to um, if we're going to get out of the securities world, there are a couple ways to do it. But the most common way is to defeat that fourth part of the definition, where the results are solely dependent on someone else. See. All four things have to be present. So if we can get rid of all the results resting on my shoulders, then we can get rid of it being a security. Now, the form of entity we take is kind of irrelevant as to whether it's a security or not. However, 
in a limited liability company, we can form something called a ma- member managed limited company company. So where Doug and Jean can be the members and we can both have voting rights. We can strike our deal so that everything, every major decision at least, has to be unanimous. I mean, the right may have the right to do the property management and write small checks, but I wouldn't have the right to open a bank account, to um, put a lease on the property, to finance the property, to sell the property without your your concurrence. Now, you, you specifically talked about an LLC. In an LLC, we can do it that way. Right. Do it that way in a limited partnership. Mm-hmm. Because in a limited partnership, there's a right. general partner and a limited partner, and a limited partner can't have those voting rights, can't play that manager role. So it has to be, it could be a general partnership. It could actually be a tenant in common, be a, be a limited liability company where we both have uh, management decisions. And in that case, we could stay away from being a, a security with one last caveat. There are some states in which an LLC or the membership in an LLC is defined at the state level as a security. So then that becomes kind of technical. If we're doing a state-only offering, what do we have? If we're doing a federal offering, what do we have? And that's a topic for another another discussion. Certainly somewhere in here, Doug, we should say uh, your listeners should uh, contact and, and consult with an attorney if what they're trying to do is avoid the securities law. Right. And absolutely, Gene, you would agree that uh, there may be a, you'll see a statement that may be true federally, but depending on what state you're in, it might flip the entire entire answer on its head. So uh, you had another reason to consult counsel on that issue, right? Right. You're okay, Gene, well, how about, uh, um, how about notes? It seems like uh, there's a lot of questions on, on our forums about, okay, I'm going to offer one person one note. Is that a security? Is that, uh, when it comes to that arena, is that true, uh, that it's not a security? That is the most difficult question you're going to ask me this morning and the most complicated answer because there is federal law that governs what a security is. And remember, I said the first word in the definition of a security is note. (laughs) So we have a problem right there. But there are also state laws that govern security offerings. And uh, if you are to do a transaction where everything is in your state, all the investors are in your state, uh, the property is in your state, the sponsor is in your state, everything is in one state, then we don't look to the federal law, we look to the state law. And then we'll have to figure out what does the state determine a note is. It may be a security, but even more importantly, the states are likely to have some rule that regulates who can be out there creating and selling notes. And oftentimes that's from the Department of Corporations or the Department of Real Estate even. I can give you an example in uh, California. An example in California is you need to have a real estate license or be an attorney or be a licensed mortgage broker to originate a note. And if you are just simply operating under your real estate license, then there are further requirements as to how many can you do, and what's the security. So it's a very complicated question. The most simple situation is I'm going to borrow some money from you. I'm going to give you a mortgage or a trust deed, whatever I have. You're the only lender. You're the only beneficiary. It's just a one-on-one deal. Uh, If I don't pay you, you break my leg. If I do pay you, it's fine. That's probably the one that we could come closest to uh, telling our people we can probably avoid uh, regulations. But, boy, if you put two investors in that note, now you're a security, no question. If it's a participating note where, Doug, I'm going to pay you 4% and 25% of the profits, that's for sure a security. 
And if I do a lot of them, then I got to look at what my state says. So once again, my advice is if you're going to be in the note business, don't ignore the fact that you may have a federal or a state issue and contact your attorney. Absolutely. Um, let me uh, move now to um, what we've we've concluded. Yeah, definitely. You know what? I, I love doing this. I, I've gained a little bit of experience, and, I, and I'd like to uh, maybe expand my capital base. It seems to me one of the main reasons to do this is, you know, as a real estate investor, you get certain momentum, you get some equity going, but sooner or later, you're going to have more deals than money, and the only way to really alleviate that is to seek outside equity participation. Let's assume we've made that decision that, yeah, I definitely want to do that. Can you tell me a little bit about why uh, you would want to uh, seek a private placement versus a full registration? That's one of the kind of the interesting scenarios. If, if, if I just go out there and I advertise, I'm, I'm, I'm actually soliciting money uh, without full registration, we've got to uh, seek a private placement exemption. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, why you would want to seek out a private placement versus a full registration? Well, in a, in, in a flow chart approach, the first thing we have to deal with is, uh, are we selling a security? And let's right. say the answer is yes. So then the rule is that every security has to be registered with the SEC unless it's exempt. So now we have another flowchart question. Are we going to register with the SEC, do a public offering, raise a lot of money, do a lot of advertising, and have complete flexibility of what we're going to do? Are we willing to spend $250,000 at a minimum and six months' time to get our deal registered with the SEC and then do um, audited statements every quarter? Or would you like to do a private placement? Would you like to do something that's exempt? Okay. And an exempt offering, as I said, is exempt one of two ways. It's either a private placement under the federal rule or it's inside of your state. If everything, once again, is inside of your state, the federal government doesn't play a game in it. Now we have to see what the state has to say. So since there are so many states probably listening to this call, let's just give them the advice that if you're going to do everything in your state, find a, an attorney in your state to advise you. But as far as the federal law goes, to keep it uh, a private placement, there's a set of rules called Regulation D, D as in dog, and they regulate private placements. And that's absolutely the way you follow the rules to do an offering that would be a private placement. And let me tell you how big this market is, Doug. The SEC just reported that in 2012, they think that the private placement market was a trillion dollars. About 20,000 offerings around the country are registered under um, Regulation D, and about a trillion dollars was raised. And the median, meaning half of the deals are bigger and half of the deals are smaller, was a million and a half dollars raised. So there's a lot of small offerings out there. There are some big offerings, 30, 40, 50 million at a time. But my, but my clients are doing a million to two million dollar offerings day and night, over and over and over. Private place. Well, it sounds, well, it sounds like there's an abundance of offerings. That is a stunning number, one trillion with a T. That, that's a huge number, and it seems like there's a, a lot of opportunity out there for someone in, that's interested in, in uh, scaling up their business. Yes, you know, we have, we can syndicate and we can help people under the securities laws syndicate everything. We've syndicated software developments. We've syndicated uh, uh, retail businesses uh, that just want to get their business and sign a lease in the space. But primarily we're doing, uh, of course, real estate from a pool of single-family houses all the way up to um, a pool of uh, mobile home parks free and clear. We have a current offering on the street now where the people are raising $20 million to do that. We also have an offering on the street for a client who's doing um, an apartment building with uh, 16 units where all they're raising is uh, $400,000. So it really does run the gamut. In fact, this is uh, really how uh, big movies are made even, isn't it? Isn't that true, Gene? Well, right. You know, we didn't talk about what a syndication is, and a syndication right. is simply 
pooling money and and you you gave a great example when you go to a movie and you see all the companies all their logos well they've syndicated their money to make a movie um, I'm going to be getting on an airplane tomorrow and that's really a syndication I pooled <laughs> my money with someone else to uh, I don't own a plane I, I can't fly so if I'm going to get somewhere I need good equipment and professional manager management and I pull my money with 140 other people and we do it so that really is not the issue. Everything you're talking about here in raising money is a syndication. The issue is whether it rises to a security, and we've been through that. One thing I want to clear up we didn't cover that I think we probably should, there's no exemption for friends and family <laughs> investments when you're trying to follow the securities law. If you were my brother and we did the deal I talked about earlier, uh, you send me your money and I run the investment, that's a security. There's absolutely no exemption for friends and family. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Gene, if, if we're looking for an Arkansas exemption, it's just not there, right? Right. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, moving on, Gene, real quick, um, let's move into, uh, I guess, the the kind of the the breakdowns. I understand there's what 504 regulation D 504, 505, and 506. Can you run us down? It seems like 506 is definitely the one most commonly used. But can you do a quick overview on what those private placement uh, provisions kind of call for generically? Yes, in uh, Rule 504, the basics of that rule is you can, and a sponsor can raise up to one million dollars in a 12-month period, not per offering but just totally in a 12-month period, all you can raise is a million dollars. Every investor has to be accredited, and you'd have to pre-register that offering in every state from which you were going to raise money. In a 505 offering, you could raise as a sponsor up to $5 million in a year, not per offering, but totally in a year. You'd have to register the offering in advance in every state, um, you can have uh, an unlimited number of accredited investors, and you can take 35 people who aren't accredited. 99% of the money raised in the private placement business, according to the SEC, is Regulation D, Rule 506. You can raise an unlimited amount of money. There's not any limit at all. You can have as many accredited investors in every transaction as you'd like. You can have up to 35 people who aren't accredited but have some level of sophistication, and we call them a sophisticated investor, and you don't have to pre-register your offering in every state where your investors are going to come from. So that's, that's the offering we would write if a client called us today and say, hey, I want to do a... Uh, I want to do an apartment building in uh, Texas. I'm sitting here in Arkansas, and I think I'm going to have some investors from four or five states, and I'm going to raise a million dollars. We'd say, well, we got to, we're got crossing state lines, so we've got to go federal, so let's do a 506 uh, offering. Okay? Excellent. Well, that raises another great question, and it's kind of uh, really seems to be nebulous out there. There are basically two mythical, magical people out there, the accredited investor and the sophisticated investors when it comes to private investment. What, are, what do those two look like if you're trying to identify, well, who's a sophisticated investor, who's an accredited investor, or what, what do they look like? All right. Now, we'd be asking this question if we were going to do a 506. Um, offering because 506 is the only offering that has a, a classification of sophisticated investors. So I'm going to pass that by just for a second. An accredited investor is identified today by economic uh, criteria. A net worth, this could be an individual or a family, a net worth of $1 million, not including, including their principal residence and or, not and, I shouldn't say and, or net worth of 200, I'm sorry, income of $200,000 a year if you're an individual filing individually or $300,000 a year if you're married filing jointly. And we'd be talking about gross 
income, the first line on their uh, on their tax return. So we'd have an unlimited number of rich people, by definition a million dollars of net worth, not counting their principal residence, or income-wise, 200000 if they're individual or 300 if they're married, filing joint. Then we can get down to the sophisticated investors who don't meet the definition of, a, of rich, but they have investment experience. They have an advisor. They've done some things in their past that let you believe that they are um, qualified to determine if the investment is suitable for them. And that's nebulous. There's no bright line on that. Um, today in a 506 offering, the way we've been doing it is the investor just simply checks a box to talk about if they're accredited. And when they testify that they're accredited, that's all you need to know. Sophisticated, you, the sponsor, make that determination by looking at a questionnaire we prepare that they fill out, and then you make a determination if you're going to take them in the deal. You're comfortable that they can understand the concept of the offering and they can determine it either alone or with their advisors that it's that it's suitable for them. On the second call, Doug, we're going to go into um, the new rule on advertising. Too complicated, too complicated for this call. We can just simply stay with the accredited investor definition right now, and uh, that'll be great. In a 506 offering, sure. most of our most of our listeners are going to do. Uh, we're going to use accredited and sophisticated investors. A sophisticated investor, it could be someone, let's say they have a $400,000 house that's free and clear and they have $200,000 mm-hmm. in their IRA account and they've bought uh, some real estate in the past. They've played the stock market in the past. They might be sophisticated, but they're not accredited. Okay. Even someone Correct. with a million-dollar house free and clear and $500,000 in their IRA as a result of several you know, 401k rollovers. Well, when you take the million dollars out because it's their principal residence, they're not accredited, but they probably are sophisticated. Well, I was going to say that sophisticated investor exemption seems to make or, or, or safe harbor, if you will, seems to be great because there's a lot of uh, IRA money out there that that really could be put to use in a in a real estate uh, syndication if you if you can. Uh, do a 506 and, and, and market to those folks. It seems like that's a, a great opportunity as well. Doug, I just had a speaker at my last uh, syndication workshop in Chicago, and he's an IRA plan administrator. And he said the figures today is there $5.8 trillion in IRA money. And uh, in uh, and 60% of the households in the United States have at least one IRA account. Sixty percent. That number is mind-boggling to me. That's outstanding. All right, Gene. Uh, we'd like to turn real quickly uh, on marketing, real quickly for the for the new, newer investor getting involved in, getting involved in this. Um, just the, the the basic question: Is it true you may not you are not allowed to market for private money to someone you do not know? Is that correct? Up until. Um September, up until September 23rd, uh, that was absolutely the rule. In order to do a private placement and be exempt from full registration, there was no general advertising or general solicitation allowed. You had to have a pre-existing ship. You had to offer your um, investments to people that you know. As of... um, September 23rd, a new wrinkle came out, and just quickly right now, it's called a 506C, and if, in fact, the sponsor wants to take the responsibility of determining that every one of their investors are accredited, and the term is, will the sponsor be reasonably assured that every investor is accredited, then we can advertise. And I'll go into that more in the second call, but for right now, for what 99% of the callers, of the people who are listening to this call, are going to do, you are right. Under a 506B, as we know it, no advertising, 
previous existing relationship is required, and uh, you have to be very careful with that. But quite honestly, most of the people who are listening to this call are already know where the people from whom they're going to raise their money on their first deal. You just haven't thought about asking them. To think that it's your first deal and you can go out and just put an ad on a website and people are going to send you a check, it's kind of unrealistic, isn't it, Doug? Not not going to happen that way. They, they need to know, like, and trust uh, is basically the... The formula I've heard, no, the people are, that are going to invest with you uh, know, like, and trust you. And I, I think that's, uh, from what, I, what I've understood about how that works, it's definitely uh, not going to happen by, by advertisement alone. But uh, let's uh, talk about that real quick, Gene. I'm really fascinated by, um, I do not know someone, but I would like to scale up my capital base. Um, I understand a lot of people... Um, create, for example, a, a informational marketing type. Uh, they are to create are to create a relationship, so to speak. So you um, hypothetically, under my understanding, of what you would want to do if you want to do this is you would send out a direct mail. Hey, come visit us. We're going to talk about uh, the state of commercial commercial real estate investing, or or like you said, in the alternative, how I can use my IRA to invest in real estate, and and just be a generic. Uh, informational type seminar to generate that relationship. Is that a, a, a viable way to kind of uh, negotiate around the general solicitation rules? Will that work? Well, yes, that is uh, exactly the, the way, you know, education-based or information-based marketing to build a database works. Um, FINRA, who is the organization that regulates the sale of securities among licensed securities brokers issued some direction, and they and they said, you know, the rule is you can't make an offer through advertising and solicitation. So if you guys want to go out there and get clients to whom you'll make offers in the future, you can do a generic presentation. You just have to assure that there's no offer made as part of that as part of that presentation. And you need a record-keeping system to make sure that anyone who comes to that generic presentation doesn't buy anything you are offering at that time or contemplating to offer in the future. So you think about what does a financial planner do. They put on a, a seminar. Um, however they get you there is kind of irrelevant. But they put on a seminar and talk to you about the wisdom of financial planning and why you need a financial plan. Then they interview and they come up with all your information, uh, what your goals are, where you are now, are you diversified or not. Then they come back and at some time in the future they present a financial plan to you. After they present the financial plan and you buy into the financial plan, it's time to start looking at specific products that meet uh, your goals. Well, that's what we can do. We can do this uh, presentation on how to invest in real estate with your IRA, which most people don't know about, and you don't talk about your products, your track record, your anything. You're just trying to give them information and see if they want to meet with you in the future to discuss this more. During the meetings, you learn about them, they learn about you, and at some point in time, you make a decision that they're suitable for your investment. Uh, that they've learned enough about you that makes you think they'd be interested in knowing about your deal. And then you can make them an offer, but the caveat, it can't be a deal that you had at the time you met them at your seminar. And, Gene, I want to follow up on that real quickly. Um, I've seen some stuff out there about cooling off. Once you've established this relationship, um, is there a set period of time, or how does cooling off, so to speak, work, where you have to basically put them in your database but maybe not hit them right away? It's not like you can uh, call them up tomorrow and, and offer them a, a deal. What, how does that process work? There is no such thing as a cooling off period. I've heard okay. rules of thumb that there's a three-touch rule. I've heard rules of thumb there's a 45-day cooling off period. Um, I'd like to say without a no-action letter from the SEC, the rule is if you meet someone through an advertisement or a solicitation, you better have a record-keeping system to make sure that you don't offer them anything 
you're offering currently or contemplated. That's the rule. So if there's an offering that just started, let's say you're having a seminar today and you started an offering yesterday, well, you have to wait till that offering is closed and the people you meet today, you can take them to your next offering. Now, let's say you don't have an offering on the street and you meet some people today. Well, I guess if your offering comes out next week, it was probably contemplated. So now you have another restriction. You can't offer them anything that's currently offered or contemplated. But sometime in the future, you can offer them something. There was one no-action letter I know about where a company said, all right, we have an offering that's going to be on, this, on the street for three years, and so we can't follow the rules. But what we're going to do is put a self-imposed 45-day cooling-off period. And the SEC said, well, as long as the first the first communication is generic and that you then you follow through and determine that the people are accredited and uh, you wait for 45 days to make them an offer, oh, that should be okay. Because what should happen in the 45 days? You probably develop a relationship with them. You can't just hang up and call them back in 45 days and make an offer and think you're going to be successful. Right? Absolutely. They've got to get to uh, know you and uh, and trust you as we as we uh, talked about before. Yeah, but if Gene, you don't have on. that particular, if you don't have that particular no action letter from the SEC about your plan, I suggest you follow the rules. That after you meet someone through advertising or solicitation, you have a record keeping system to make sure they don't buy anything you're currently offering. But what if you know someone? Well, then call them up and make an offer. Because <laughs> there's, you know, I know you. I don't know really if we have a pre-existing relationship, but let's say we did. Let's say we've been talking about this for a while, and I know you're, and I know you're interested in in self storage, and that's what I do, self storage. And I kind of get right. the feeling that you'd like to invest some money with me if I had a deal. Well, then I could just call you and make an offer. Okay? But anyone who's listening to this phone call. If I just simply said, and oh, by the way, I've got a current offering, why don't you give me a call at the office? Well, I could probably deal with those people, and I could probably put them in my database and develop a relationship so that sometime in the future when I had an offering, if I thought the offering was suitable for them, I could call them back one-on-one -on -one and make them an offer. Outstanding. That that really clarifies that that point, Gene. Thank you for that. Gene, let's say you're you're really, really, really into this. You're really fascinated uh, about syndication. And in fact, let's say you've learned how to market for deals, um, but you're not exactly sure the next step. What would your advice be if, let's say, I'm sitting on a, uh, a marketing campaign and I come across great deals from time to time, but uh, I'm newer to the business. What would your advice be in, in terms of breaking into syndication? Okay, I'll give you... Um I'll give you the first five steps, okay, that I think. First step is to find a partner to do this with. And the reason I say that, if Doug, if you came to me and said, I've got this great deal, I need $50,000 from you, and that's the minimum investment. The first question I'm going to ask you is, well, Doug, if I give you the $50,000, what happens if something happens to you? Hmm. And if you can't answer that question, more than likely you won't get any money from any investors. So you've got to have a, a, a manager entity set up. You've got to have some written documentation. But you've got to have continuity. Okay, that's the number one thing I think you should do. The number two thing I think you should do is develop a database. Start working on your database. It's an ongoing project. You're always building your database. You're always looking for new clients. But to start with, let's say you're going to raise a million and a half dollars. I think you should have uh, 50 people in your database from whom you think you can get $25,000 the first time you call them and ask them on a 50% success ratio. So you have your 50 people in your database. You think, boy, if I call every one of them, 25 of them will give me $25,000. And I'm half the way to my million and a half dollar offering. I think that's the second step. The third step is your offering has to 
involve a specific property. Don't try a blind pool. Don't do anything just by, here's the one property we're going to buy and tell all of your investors about it. That's where you will be um, successful. And then I think the next thing I would do is I would give myself from today, if this is something someone wanted to do, six months to close my first deal. Not that it's in escrow for six months, but finding a partner, getting your database going, finding that specific deal, put it in an escrow, uh, getting all the paperwork done, and then closing the deal. Uh, those are the, the, the first steps. I have one caveat. This is not a nothing down business being a syndicator. All the way along the line, you're going to be incurring costs, and you're going to have to have some money. That's another reason it's a good idea to have a partner. But... Uh, <laughs> You should get all your money back when the deal closes if we draft the documents correctly or whoever your attorney is. Uh, right. We work all around the country. If the documents are drafted correctly, there'll be, there'll be provisions in there that you get all of your out-of-pocket expenses back. That's a great question, Gene. On, on, that, on that note, what uh, kind of uh, budget number should somebody have in mind? If they're looking at doing a syndication, uh, what, kind of, what kind of capital should they anticipate up front coming out of pocket uh, with, as you said, they'll be re reimbursed by the syndication, but uh, out of the syndication when it closes, but what should they have in mind in terms of uh, putting this all together? This will deal great, very greatly depending upon the amount of money you have to use for earnest money to tie up the property. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's ignore that one because I really don't know what that would be. But the costs of doing the syndication, I would say uh, twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars should get you clearly all the legal documentation you need, uh, plenty of money to do your due diligence, your surveys, your phase one, and all that. When I when I look at my clients, uh, not counting their earnest money, I think twenty-five to fifty will 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 get you going. Outstanding. Well, Gene, I think that covers our, our, our private money 101 call here. I just wanted to go ahead and wrap up on that. But real quick, Gene, could you tell us a little bit if uh, they're interested in, in uh, the book you wrote, which, by the way, was outstanding, uh, group, uh, it's a whole new business. How, how would they be able to get their hands on that book? Well, if the listeners would like to go to my, my education website, which is called groupsponsor.com, that's one word, groupsponsor.com. They'll find two things there. First of all, they'll find a free MP3 file that they can download where I cover 11 of the most asked questions I get in about an hour audio with you. And then the second thing they can see is they can see that we offer workshops and the book. And they can find the book on the website and, uh, and buy that. Well, folks, that wraps up Private Money 101 for next semester, meaning next week. We will talk Private Money 201 with Gene as we discuss the Jobs Act, what exactly crowdfunding is, and tips on scaling your syndication. We will additionally tackle the deep question of, is this for you? Have a great week, and happy investing, everyone.